I mean, I'm sure everybody is uh, familiar with Father Calloway and all the incredible things he has done, especially this year and uh, in the year of St. Joseph. Uh, you know I don't really have a whole lot to say about him because you guys probably know everything about him. Um, he did fly in from Massachusetts. That's good. He had to get out of the cold up there. And, um, and for those who didn't know, he was ordinated in 2003. So he's, what, 18, 18 years now. And he has a BA from uh, Franciscan University at Steubenville. And he has a Master of Divinity from the Dominican Houses of Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, we all know he's the surfer priest. But I noticed on his hobbies, he had all these mountain places he goes to. So I don't know how Father's doing surfing up there, but he is. So anyway, he's here to talk about a consecration to St. Joseph. So with much pleasure, Father, we're so happy that you're here. Uh, let me introduce Father Donald Calloway. I feel a pressured man. <laughs> like I gotta deliver something special. Um, okay, so I think it's so cool that you guys did the, the national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. That only in Texas, man. Let's yeah. <laughs> go. Well, you know the rest. All right, so, anyway. All right, so let's say a prayer, okay? I know we already did, but for me, I need I need prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. So what I'm going to talk about is the um, consecration to St. Joseph in the year of St. Joseph, because today is day 234 of the year of St. Joseph. We've only got uh, like five weeks left of this very special year. And it is a special year, my friends, because we've never had one before. And in all likelihood, I hope I'm wrong on this, but I don't think that I am. I don't think we're going to get another year of St. Joseph in our lifetime. It only took the church 2,020 years to crank this one out, you know what I'm saying? So, kind of unlikely that we're going to get another one. Who knows, perhaps. Um, but this is a special time that we need to take advantage of. So in order to, to fully cover this, I do need to back up. Because, you know, St. Joseph is really the mystery man of Christianity. Um, who are you, right? What are you? Like, how, what was, how old were you? All these kind of questions come to mind when you think about St. Joseph. And if you know my story, uh, being a convert to Catholicism, really bad dude, right, in my earlier years, really jacked things up, and then the Lord gave me the divine two by four, hammered me with the truth, I fell madly in love with Jesus, with Our Lady, with the church, the sacraments, the teachings, all that stuff. And when I was having this experience, these awesome Filipino women, I call them the special forces of God, right? They're the green berets in the spiritual life. Watch out for these Filipino ladies, right? They'll take you down. They mean business, right? Nobody does Catholicism like little Filipino ladies, you know? So I'm still convinced when they're born in Manila, they're given a name and a novena. <laughs> like, this will be your novena for life. Okay. So, um, so they told, brought me over to a statue of St. Joseph in this church. And their subtle way of catechizing me, this really messed up guy who at that time had long hair down on my waist and I just looked a sight. And they, they brought me to the statue and they said, you need to talk to him, <laughs> right? Meaning St. Joseph. That was their way of telling me, you're really messed up and he isn't and you need to be like him. So I understood what they were doing. But you know what that statue, as awesome as it was, and I did, I began to go there every day to pray and to ask him to help me to be a good man and basically changed my life entirely. But that statue, maybe you've seen them. What did it look like? Well, he looked about 95, <laughs> right? It wasn't really inspiring to me. I didn't look at the statue and say, sign me up, brother. I want to be just like that, you know? You look like you're about to croak, homie. You look like you're about to die. I didn't get it. And so I thought, okay, I mean, this is St. Joseph. He's, he was part of this whole thing. and. Um, I guess he's really awesome because 
he was put in charge of Jesus and he was the husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So he's got to be somebody special. So I just assume because that statue and pretty much all the other statues that I would see after that for years and images on, on Christmas cards. St. Joseph looked like he was like so old. He was more like the great grandfather of Jesus than the father of Jesus. So I was like, I don't know. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a theologian or historian at that time. So I was like, I guess that's just the way it went down. You know, I don't get it. I don't particularly care for it, but it is what it is. Who am I to question it? I just assumed that that was the teaching of the church, that St. Joseph was an old man. Is it? No, it isn't. I didn't know that, though. Actually, I heard priests from the pulpit talk about this kind of stuff on occasion. And I was just like, okay, again, the priest is affirming it, so I guess he's old. But, you know, when I was inspired to, to really do something with St. Joseph about five years ago, when I traveled the world, gathering research and having things translated from Poland and Croatia and down in Central America and over in Asia, Malta, all these countries, I realized the church has never in any documents, official do like encyclicals, apostolic letters, catechisms, talked about St. Joseph being an old man. So what's up? Why do the majority of his statues and paintings and Christmas cards show him as old? Why is that? Well, because he is the mystery man. We only have a few things from him in the New Testament. We don't have any words. And by the way, that was a funny thing. When I was doing the research for the book, I knew this was going to be money. I knew this was going to be a huge thing. I knew this was going to be a massive movement in the church. And I was telling people, I'm writing this book, man. I'm telling you, get ready. It's coming. And people would say to me in response to that, that's nice, Father. <laughs> right? Because how do you write a book about a dude who didn't say anything? You're right? So they're expecting like a little pamphlet, a little prayer card for St. Joseph. And then when the book came out and it was this thick, they were like, Father, right? You, you fudging this thing? You making this stuff up, man? How do you get all that information? He didn't say anything, right? Right. Because he's the mystery man. And because he's the mystery man, right, we don't have any words for him in the New Testament, but we have his actions and only a few instances of those. And before I go further, this is fascinating, right? Where do we get that stuff from in the New Testament about St. Joseph, his actions? They're in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. That's the only places he appears. Did Matthew and Luke know St. Joseph? No. They didn't know him. Remember, when, when the Holy Family, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and then they had to go off to Egypt for years, then they went back to Nazareth, nobody knew that the Messiah was living on the earth. Matthew and Luke were going about their business, doing their jobs. They were probably about the same age. They were little boys when Jesus himself was growing up. And by the time that Jesus started his public ministry, St. Joseph was already deceased. They never met St. Joseph. So did Matthew and Luke fudge it? Did they have a meeting, of, you know, one day, strategic planning program for the New Testament and say, hey, hey, Luke, I got nothing. You know, I, I don't know, man. What do you got? You got nothing too? All right. You come up with a little story. Hey, I like that. Some old dude in the temple. They, that's good. Put that in yours. I'll put, they lost them for three days or something in mine. And we'll, we'll work, we'll work it. Fill in the gaps, you know? No, they didn't do that. They weren't winging it, rolling dice, right? They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they would have heard this stuff from one particular person who stuck around with the church at the beginning, after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord who stayed with the church for many years to teach them about things they would have never known. And who was that? Mary. That's right, Our Lady. I guarantee you on several occasions, she sat down with Matthew and Luke and said, let me tell you about the time that we went to the temple and there was this old man and he said to me that my heart would be pierced and our son would be the cause of division. And the reason that he said it to me directly, because that meant that he wasn't gonna be there. Joseph wasn't going to be there when all this happened. Put that in there, Matthew. Or, or Luke, let me tell you about the time when, when we went down to Jerusalem for the festivities and we were there and it was wonderful and we were going back to Nazareth and I thought Jesus was in the caravan with the men. He thought he was with me, with the mothers and three days, three days, we lost them. We went back, we found them in the temple. Put that in there. That's where that stuff comes from. You know, it's funny, today we have scholars with PhDs who can speak Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and all these other languages. And they scratch their heads at this and go, yeah, where did Matthew and Luke get this? Dude, 
dude, you spent 25 years getting these degrees and you don't know this? This is like a no-brainer, homie, right? But they don't. They don't, they don't get it. It's so simple. So Our Lady was championing St. Joseph at the beginning of the church. Keep that in mind, because that's very important for what we're living in today. I'll get to that. So, back to that whole thing about him being old. So because there are not a lot of material in there about those kind of issues, people at the beginning of the church had this mentality, rightly intentioned, that Our Lady is so beautiful, right? So lovely, so in, in her spirit, her soul primarily, of course, but that pours out even into her body. The beauty of this woman is so extraordinary. She is the greatest creature that has ever lived, the most beautiful to behold on every level. How could a man live with such a beauty, live with such a perfect creature, and not have desires of the flesh. How could he do this? This is impossible for a man to do. So what did they say? He was like 120 years old. <laughs> he had, the, the fire was dead. There was no passion, he's practically, he's about to croak. So he had no, you know, that's why they did this. I'm not making this up. They thought it's impossible for a man to live in a relationship because of that special, unique marriage of no conjugal union, because of the sake of their mission. There's no way he could do this unless he was, he had, he was, he was about to croak, so he has to be old. Many of these accounts, I'm not making this up, they have him being in his 90s when he married the Blessed Virgin Mary. But is it true? Is it true? No, it is not. It is not true. As a matter of fact, there are even recent studies, I wish I had time to unpack this, and I don't want to go too academic and theological, but it's profound. There's a guy, um, I think he's from Louisiana, but I think he lives in Colorado now, Dr. Brant Petrie. He's got some videos on this that under our noses for 2,000 years, divine revelation in the scriptures, we can know how old St. Joseph was. But we haven't, we haven't known this until now. What, what, is, what does he mean specifically? So in the Greek, in the New Testament, whenever the word man is used, they have distinctions. In English, we don't have this. We just say man. That man can be 20 years old. He can be 40. He can be 85. We just have the classification of man. But in other languages, they oftentimes have categorizations for an age group. And in Greek, uh, they do. So when you hear about the old man Simeon, right, the word that is used there in the Greek, you don't hear old. It's just one word, presbytus, and that means an old man, and it's got an age bracket. When you hear uh, other men, it's an age bracket. When it says that the virgin was betrothed to a man named Joseph, you hear the word aner in Greek. Not presbytus, not any of the other ones. And everybody in first century Judaism, and you can do the research, it's in the books, knew that that meant he was between the ages of 25 and 40. 25 and 40. That kind of changes things, doesn't it? You bet it does. As a matter of fact, it makes St. Joseph all the more virtuous. Because he wasn't half dead with his passions, you know, gone. He was in the prime of his life. He was a man so holy that he could live with the most beautiful woman ever, and yet have chastity of heart, of eyes, and intentions. That is tough to do, brothers. You know this. I'm not going to go too deep here because there's ladies present, <laughs> right? Tough to do, man. This guy did it for decades with the dove of God, with the Immaculata. I mean, think about this. They say that St. Catherine of Siena, right, she was so beautiful. So, and she knew it. She cut her hair to try and get guys to stop courting her and following her. You know, at certain times she had to have seven priests follow her. Why? Because when people saw her, they would pass out or have conversions on the spot because of her feminine beauty. That's St. Catherine of Siena. What about Our Lady? Are you kidding me? How many times have we heard in apparitions when she comes, little children fall to their knees and they cry because she's so beautiful. She smells like roses. I mean, hello. And yet this guy, St. Joseph, was so equipped with virtue that he was able to, to, to live in that marriage and be the guardian of the virgin, the protector of the virgin. 
All words that signify what? Manhood and strength and power. He wasn't an old man. Oh, no, no. He wasn't the same age as Our Lady. Tradition says that she was probably around 16 or so when the angel came to her. So he was a little older, but not a whole lot. Not like he's been depicted. That's amazing, my friends. And I've got tons of quotes in the book from some like Venerable Fulton Sheen, Mother Angelica, St. Jose Maria Escrivá, and a ton of others that talk about this in ways that are better than I'm saying right now. They articulate it in, in amazing ways. Or what about this one? Have you ever heard this? I heard this when I was becoming Catholic. Every now and then I still hear it, and it disturbs me. And now as a priest, you've got to pray for me, because if a brother priest ever says at the Mass, I'm pulling the plug. I'm like, bro, sit down. <laughs> Have you ever heard this one? That St. Joseph was a widower in a previous marriage and had children from another woman and brought those children into his marriage with the Blessed Virgin Mary. How many of you out of curiosity have heard that? Right. I certainly did. Is that the teaching of the Catholic Church? No. Never has been. You will find this in zero documents of the Catholic Church. Interesting. So then why are people saying this? Why, 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 why do even priests sometimes say this from the pulpit? Well, in the early church again, when the scriptures were being written, they said, if you remember this, you read about the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Remember that? So in the early church, some people said, we got a situation, <laughs> you know, uh, how's that work? Um, she's a virgin, perpetual virgin. Those aren't her kids. So whose kids are these? Who are these brothers and sisters of Jesus? So people thought, we got to solve this problem, this, this dilemma. So they said, he was a widower. Problem solved, right? He was already married. That's why he's old. And his wife, first wife died or something. And those are his kids. Those are his kids. So that they thought was solving the problem. But is it true? No, it is not true. The church has never taught this. These are legends. These come from what are called apocryphal sources. Non-inspired, non-canonical, not like the scriptures. Some dudes winging it, really, to try and fill in the gaps and solve what they thought were problems. But see, there was no problem. If you look at St. Jerome, the greatest biblical scholar ever, and all the greatest theologians, St. Thomas Aquinas, all of them, they all say that when the gospel writers use those words, brothers and sisters, it's because in the Greek at that time, not modern Greek, but 2,000 years ago, they didn't have a word for cousins. And so they simply used brothers and sisters, no matter what the relationship was, ne nieces, nephews, cousins, all that kind of stuff, they would use brothers and sisters. You find that all throughout the New Testament. You actually find that today in many cultures. If you go to Africa, almost every country in Africa, all your relatives, no matter what relation they are, are called brothers and sisters. Many countries in Asia, I remember the first time I went to the Philippines, I've been to the Philippines many times, I was tripping because everybody was referring to everybody else as brother and sister. I'm like, dang, there's some inbreeding going on up in here. You know? <laughs> but that's not what they meant, right? It, it, any kind of relationship, they were called a brother and a sister. And then I got it. I was like, oh, okay, y'all aren't weird, but I get it now, you know? And you'll find this in, in India as well. Still happens to this day, even though we even have the words today, unlike, you know, 2,000 years ago in, in Greek of cousins and nephews and stuff. They still use brother and sister. So that's why these two misunderstandings of St. Joseph came into existence. Well-intentioned, protect the virginity of Our Lady. Yes, we must always. She is Our Lady who is a perpetual virgin, our dear mother. But you don't have to make up fables and legends to do it. No, no, no. And you don't have to say that, that Joseph was in a previous marriage and had children uh, to, to, to understand that brothers and sisters uh, thing in the New Testament. No, no, no. That's fascinating stuff. So as we go through church history, you get people talking about St. Joseph, but not in any deep, really profound ways. Like we don't have a theological discipline dedicated to him. We do now called Josephology, the study of St. Joseph, but not at the beginning of the church. You only heard about him in sermons and homilies from bishops, you know, uh, at Christmas time. Pretty much. That's it. Not a whole lot. And as we go through the church centuries, you get certain saints who tried to emphasize him because they tapped into something and they realized, you know, this man had to be something special. 
He wasn't just a random guy selected for this important role. He was prepared for this. He, he was given extraordinary virtues and privileges and, 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 and dignity to be able to fulfill his mission. And they would try and tell people this. But many times these weren't the theologians who were doing it. They were pious souls, saintly souls, like St. Teresa of Avila. Oh, what a great woman, right? She reformed the Carmelites and she renamed all of her, her, her uh, reformed convents after St. Joseph. And she wrote a diary. If you want to be a saint, write a diary, right? <laughs> It, it seems to work, you know? So, make sure it's good, though. Don't put my weird in there, okay? So, she writes this diary, and she says, basically, um, if you don't believe me, because she said, I've never gone to St. Joseph and been disappointed, but if you don't believe me, she challenged her readers to a test. Try it for yourself, she said. And many people did, including one of her friends, St. John of the Cross, the greatest mystic in Christianity. And yet, he confessed that he did not understand St. Joseph, because he's a mystery man. And yet, St. John of the Cross is like the master of the interior life. And yet, he did not understand the master of the interior life, the great St. Joseph. But he took his friend's challenge up, and he got it. A light went off, and he understood. It's one of the first quotes that I have in the book, that he says, I didn't understand, and now I understand the greatness of St. Joseph. But you know what St. Teresa of Avila didn't have? Internet, <laughs> right? She can, couldn't get that diary, that autobiography out to the whole world, you know, so people could catch on to this whole St. Joseph you know, powerhouse. So it was regional. Spain, where she was from, had a great devotion to St. Joseph. And that's how it went throughout the centuries. You know, the missionaries hadn't gone out to the four corners of the earth yet. So these things were regional, like Spain had a devotion. Italy had some pious priests and pious nuns who, who had a great devotion to St. Joseph, very strong there. Or Portugal, Malta, off the charts. I've never seen a country as devoted to St. Joseph as Malta. It's absolutely amazing. Granted, it's a small little island, but it's amazing what they've done and for centuries. But it, it wasn't global. It didn't go out anywhere, you know, worldwide, just regional. And then going through the centuries, just a little over 100 years ago, our northern neighbor, Canada, Pray for them, right? Full-blown communism up there right now. <laughs> you know, it's insane, man. So just a little bit below Australia at this point, you know. So, so there was a humble brother up there, Brother Andre Bassett, not ordained a priest. He wasn't a theologian, simple little guy. People would come to him daily with marital problems, family problems, health issues, financial problems. And would he give, offer them something back, some theological tome, you know, to strengthen them in hope? No. He would say to them, go to Joseph. That's all he said. And it worked. The miracles associated with, with that place are incredible. And he began construction on what is today the world's largest shrine dedicated to St. Joseph. The great oratory of St. Joseph in Montreal. Wow, it is an amazing place. I think it's like the 11th largest church in the world. It's probably the largest in North America. Maybe the D.C. Basilica here in, in the U.S. is bigger. I'm not sure, but it's amazing. Amazing. And he died in a very holy life, and now he's Saint Andre Bassett. But again, it didn't have that ability at that time of what we have today to press a button and send this message out to the world. So Canada knew about it, and North America a little bit, or the United States, but not the rest of the world. So what happened? What happened that we're experiencing what we're experiencing right now with the year of St. Joseph and everywhere you go net right now, you just hear St. Joseph, St. Joseph, St. Joseph, St. Joseph. He's everywhere. Something is happening that we can pinpoint it to an exact year of when this, what I call the snowball down the hill was thrown by God and it gained momentum mass and it's just been building and building and building and it's crescendoing right now with this year of St. Joseph. So when was that? The year was 1870. 151 years ago. Last year it was 150. And I'll get, talk more about that. 1870. What happened in 1870? Well, there was a great Pope, Pius IX, who was receiving letters from people all around the world, from cardinals, bishops, priests, lay people, all around the world, and they were saying to him, Dear Holy Father, the times are difficult. We're asking you to declare St. Joseph the patron of the universal church, of the entire church. Now, what's significant about that? Because the word patron comes from pater, which means father. That's huge. 
to make people aware, not to, to make it, it already is, it's just people don't know about it. Just like Our Lady is the mother of Jesus, therefore she's the mother of the mystical body, the church. So St. Joseph, though not the biological father of Jesus, he's the true father of Jesus, just like I've been adopted, my last name is Calloway. I'm not biologically related to my dad, but he's my dad. I am blessed to have him as my father. I don't call him stepdad or foster father, he's my dad. I love him. Same thing with, with Joseph and Jesus. He was his true father, which means Joseph is also the true father of the mystical body of Christ, the church. But most people weren't aware of this. So they were writing these letters. Holy Father, please do this for the good of the church. Let people know about St. Joseph. But he was very busy during his pontificate. He was doing a lot of things, and he was a little hesitant to do that. Then he got a letter from a pious Dominican priest in France. And this is what this priest, Father Jean-Joseph Latast, put in this letter. He said, Dear Holy Father, I too ask you to do this and I offer my life as a sacrifice. Every hardship, every suffering I endure for this one purpose that you would declare St. Joseph the patron of the church. The Pope was so moved by that letter that that's, this priest offered his life that he said, and I have the quotes in the book, I will do it. The letter from this Dominican priest has so moved me that I will declare this. Do you know what happened to that priest shortly after that? He died dead. Be careful. <laughs> right? Do you know how old he was when he died? 33, right? They all going down when they're 33, you know? I remember when I was 33, I would look five times crossing the street. This could be the one, man. This could be the year, you know? I ain't got nothing to worry about now. I'm way past that. But if you're 32 or 33, you better be careful. It could be your year, you know? So he dies, the Pope declares it, and that began things going with St. Joseph. When the Pope does something like that, the Vicar of Christ, graces come from heaven. What happened right after that papal declaration, 1870? In 1879, so just a few years after, guess who came in an apparition? St. Joseph. Unheard of. St. Joseph, right? You, that's Our Lady. Yes, she was there. She brought her husband. Remember at the beginning of the church house, she would champion him to Matthew and Luke, telling them stories that they would put in their Gospels, right? Well, now in these difficult times, she, in apparitions, is going to bring her beloved husband because we need him. So in 1879, where was this? Where, where did Our Lady and St. Joseph come? Ireland. Ireland. Knock Ireland. Approved apparition on a rainy day, of course, in Ireland. Fifteen people saw this heavenly vision of Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John the Evangelist, interesting, and a lamb, literally a lamb, depicting our Lord as the Lamb of God. And here's the funny thing I find funny anyway about this apparition. St. Joseph is on the scene. Speak, right? Say something. You never said anything. Now's your time. Now's your chance. You got an opportunity, right? He didn't say anything. <laughs> Neither did Our Lady. They didn't need to. Nobody said anything in this apparition. Their presence comforted the people that were there. Why? Because Ireland was going through a famine. That began the great immigrations from Ireland to America and other places because they, they needed work and they needed food. So the, this lasted for hours on this rainy day in 1879. Now it's fully approved. It's an international Marian shrine. We call it Our Lady of Knock. St. Joseph always takes back. That's what a good man does. He doesn't want to shine. He puts his wife forward. Let her be recognized. That's what good men, good husbands and fathers do. It's what he always does. It's what he's always done. So after that apparition, we had something tremendous happen. We got a pope who was an incredible pope, Pope Leo XIII. He wrote the church's official first document on St. Joseph, an encyclical in 1889. Now, I have to say, as a priest, this is embarrassing. Why? Because it took the church 1,889 years to get an official document on St. Joseph. But we got it, and it is a zinger. That Pope could write an encyclical, my friends. To the point, not super long, and packed a punch. Right? There was no ambiguity or, you know, you're scratching your head like, I'm not sure what that's saying, let me read it for the 27th time. No, super clear. An amazing document. When the Pope did that, remember, this is not just some random dude writing this. This is the Vicar of Christ. What happened after that? Heaven responded. 
Who came again in an apparition? St. Joseph. Anybody want to give a shot at where this one was? Fatima. That's right. Now you're probably thinking, oh, poor Father Calloway, what seminary did you go to, Father? That was Our Lady. Yes, primarily so, but she brought her husband. It's a fully approved aspect of the Fatima apparitions that St. Joseph was there at the last apparition, October 13th, 1917. If you're not familiar with it, that's the final one of the Fatima apparitions, the big one, where 70 plus thousand people were in a field and they saw the sun spin and gyrate and pulse like it was going to collide with the earth. Even the local secular authorities saw this. They didn't believe the children, but they believed after that when the sun was pulsing and doing things that, you know, scientifically we should have been destroyed, but they saw it. And all three children, the little visionary children, said that right after that, this is important, after the chaos in the sky, they saw the father and the son. Joseph and Jesus, and together, Father and Son blessed the world. That, my friends, is the forgotten aspect of the Fatima apparitions, part of the fully approved message of Fatima, the presence of St. Joseph and the blessing of him and his fatherhood. Why? Because Our Lady talked about the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. Boy, did we long for that. I want that so bad. Because basically that means the, the reign of Christ the King. Right? It's all about Jesus. But is Our Lady's heart going to be triumphant when we live in a time right now where half of all marriages end in divorce? I know this well. I had three fathers before I was 10 years old. I'm a product of this. Dude, we live in a time right now, we put the ancient Romans and Greeks to shame with our perversion, our sickness, and our filthiness in our pornographic era. We are so messed up. Boys by the age of nine are exposed, exposed to hardcore pornography on their smartphones today and their devices. Really? We are messed up. Our Lady's not triumphing in this. We've got to bring in the Father. We've got a certain patricide that's being, happening in, in society right now. The elimination of the fatherhood. The mocking of it. The ridiculing of it. You know, there's so, certain cultures, 70 to 75% of those children are raised in the home without a father. I could, if I, I have it on my phone, I have to search for my picture to give you the statistics. Sociological studies have been done that show that when a father is not in, a part of a home, Exponentially, it goes up that the kids are going to drop out of high school, they're going to become addicted to drugs, they're going to be incarcerated, they're going to become homeless and suicidal. Seriously, we are living in a crazy time. That message of Fatima is so important that we need to tap into it a hundred years later. Sister Lucia dos Santos, and if you remember her, she's one of the visionaries from Fatima. The one I say got the short end of that stick, right? The others already canonized when they were children. She's like, hello. Right? She lived to be like 100. I mean, you'll get there, sister. Right? So she said later in life she became a nun in Portugal, and she told a cardinal this. She said that the final battle between good and evil will be fought over ecology? No. <laughs> Marriage and family. Why? Because that's the building block of civilization. If that falls, everything crumbles. Kind of a no-brainer why everything is crumbling today when we've redefined marriage. Now we think it's legit normal and people have rights for two dudes to get married or two women to get married. This is so jacked up, but we think it's funny. We got shows called Modern Family. We entertain ourselves with this stuff. Past the Twizzlers and popcorn, it's family night. Let's watch some twisted, deranged thing and laugh. That's how jacked up we are. Oh, and people would hear this and they'd say, Father, you're a homophobe. Oh, no, I'm not. I, I, I have family members who suffer from SSA and all these things. We're all broke, wounded, all of that. All of us. But there's right and there's wrong. There's truth and there's falsehood. There's light and there's darkness. You can't start saying two plus two equals five. It's wrong. There is an answer to the problem. You may get it wrong and we'll work with that, right? We'll, we'll get, but there is a correct answer. It's the same thing with doctrine. This ain't changing. There's a lot of people that want to change it today, even in the church. But it ain't changing, my friends. And we have got to get back to the, to the basics again, because we've forgotten it. How many Catholics today are in favor of this stuff and, and make nothing of it and vote that way? What, what has happened to us? Because we've lost our minds. People today don't even know which bathroom to use, right? 
Really, it is absolutely insane what is going on in our times. We gotta bring in the Father. We've got to restore the importance of fatherhood, real fatherhood. Because how many people today have been wounded by a man, sadly? I myself have inflicted these wounds. In my previous days, I was an idiot in my manhood. And the things that I did, I hurt people emotionally, sometimes physically, and, and worse. We messed it up. But we've got to restore it. And what, what do we look to? The sports figures? Because you're wearing his jersey, you think you're going to be some superhero? You ain't. You gotta become like one particular man, primarily Jesus Christ. But he's a divine person. You're never gonna be God, right? But he's given us a model of a man that he himself wanted to be like. That's amazing, my friends. Think this through. See, we have not unpacked the anthropology of, of, of the Holy Family and the importance of St. Joseph. When God came down to earth in the divine person of Jesus, took on human nature, masculinity in particular, not because it's better than femininity, because we all know it ain't, bro, right? Uh -uh. The feminine genius and mystery, us men, pray for us, right? You ladies, just, you're, you're greater than we are, right? The greatest human person who ever lived was not a man. Jesus is a divine person. The greatest human person who ever lived was a woman, our lady, our blessed mother. But when God took on human nature, he wanted to share the facial characteristics of one particular creature, and that was Our Lady. On some level, he looked like his mom because he lived in her body for nine months, just like I look like my mom. Everybody who sees my mom says, Father, wow, you look just like your mother. Cheekbones, eye sockets, the whole thing. We all resemble our mother on some level. Now, Jesus does not look like Joseph, physically, because he's not his biological father. But when you see Jesus, you are seeing Joseph. What do I mean by that? Remember there was an occasion when Jesus, disciples are gathered around him, and he's, one of them says to him, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. No, that disciple was not talking about Joseph. He was talking about the Heavenly Father, right? God. And Jesus said in response, what do you mean, show you the Father? In seeing me, you have seen the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been like, yeah, what? I don't understand, right? You're not the Father, but I don't, I don't get it. See, the Father did not become incarnate. The Heavenly Father does not have a body. By the way, some people trip on this today. I'm like, where'd you get catechized? People think that the Father has a body, like Jesus does. He doesn't. We depict him as an old man because that's, you know, fatherhood. But he didn't take on flesh like Jesus did. He doesn't have arms or legs. So how can we see the Father when we see Jesus? Because Jesus says on another occasion, I can only do and say what I see the Father doing and saying. It's like Father, like Son. You ever hear spitting image? Boys imitate their dads. Jesus imitates his heavenly Father for all eternity. He's the eternal Son of the eternal Father. Interesting. Because see, that same truth applies to Joseph and Jesus. So Jesus won't look like Joseph biologically in his facial countenance and all of that. No. But when you see Jesus in his mannerisms, his accent, the way he swings an axe, the way he shaves wood, the way he treats a lady, you're seeing Joseph. Because God, in the person of Jesus, imitated Joseph. God, this is so amazing. Listen to this. God wanted to be like Joseph. God didn't want to be like you and me. Mm -mm. And God doesn't obey you and me. But God wanted to be like Our Lady and like St. Joseph. And God obeyed Our Lady and St. Joseph. God doesn't obey angels. This is why Our Lady and St. Joseph are greater than the angels. All of them. No matter what choir. St. Michael ain't offended by this. It's the truth. This is how profound St. Joseph is. How deep he is. The closeness of his union with Christ. And the power that he has. And we've got to acknowledge that fatherhood and restore that fatherhood in the Holy Family by getting a correct understanding of St. Joseph and bringing this into globally families so that men are not ogres and cavemen wielding their authority and physical strength in wrong ways and hurting people because that's what so many have done. No, sacrificial leadership. How many people today are so triggered when they hear that a man is called to be the head of the family? Boy, the feminists get all messed up, right? How dare you? Right? It's because you don't know what we're talking about. 
real manhood, not a caveman. Woman, make me breakfast. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a man who would die for you, take a bullet for you, sacrifice himself for you, climb mountains for you, swim an ocean for you, and your family and your children. That kind of manhood. A man who would be willing to take you uh, into foreign territory, let's say Egypt, where there's bandits and marauders, and protect you. That's real manhood. That's why he was a young man, not an old man about to croak. This is the real St. Joseph, the guardian of the virgin, the protector of the holy family. Real manhood, sacrificial manhood. Wow. We have not unpacked this aspect of St. Joseph until modern times. So, after the Fatima apparitions, amazing things begin to happen. The snowball keeps going and it gets big. We get finally the approval of the litany of St. Joseph, which by the way, if you've done the book already, you know is, is the template for the book. Why? Because in that, we get the official titles of St. Joseph. Not titles that Father Calloway came up with or Sister so-and-so or, no, the official ones by the church. And what are some of these titles? Listen to these, just a few. He's called the uh, glory of domestic life. You imagine that? Wouldn't that be great if men today were called the glory of domestic life? If, if, if little Johnny had a show and tell at school and, and, and the teacher said, next week, everybody bring in a picture of your dad. Sadly, half of them wouldn't be able to do that probably. But those who did, they brought in the picture of their dad and little Johnny said, the teacher said, honey, describe your, your dad to the class. And little Johnny said, my dad is the glory of our home life. So many cannot do that. Or another title, he's called the pillar of families. The pillar, a pillar holds things up. You lose that pillar, it falls. He was the pillar for the holy family. We need more men today to be pillars for their families, spiritual leaders for their families. Think about this. In the life of the Holy Family, you've got Jesus, who's God. He's divine. You've got Our Lady, who's not God, but she's an immaculate creature. She's perfect as a creature. And then Joseph. Whose role was it in that family unit to lead the prayers? Was it the role of Jesus? Nope. Was it the role of the Blessed Virgin? No, it was not. Whose role was it? Joseph's, the least of those members. Our Lord and Our Lady could have done it much better than he, but they didn't usurp his role. Nope, they let him do it. Lead, and he did. And boy, did he ever. And you know, that example, you can do, Google it. You'll find the sociological studies that have shown that when the prayer and the practice of religion in a, in a family is only left up to the wife and the mother, as good as that is, and sometimes women have to do that because something's wrong or he's gone or whatever it may be, it's understood, but, when it's only the mother who's doing it, the chances of those children continuing on with the faith when they leave from underneath that roof of mother, not very high. Because that's just what mom did. That's what mom, mom, mom was all about. But when dad is the one who leads the family in prayer, takes the family to church, dresses his little sweetheart up and says, honey, we're going to mass. Let's look beautiful for Jesus. Gets his little boy a rosary. When the man leads, it goes up exponentially. That when those children leave and they go off to college, they'll continue the practice of their faith. Because there's something special about dad. The devil knows this. That's why he is delighted, you could say, with this patricide that has happened in culture. Look at sitcoms today. How is manhood portray portrayed? He's a buffoon. He's an idiot. He's a moron. He lies on the couch eating his Doritos, watching NASCAR. He's so incompetent his wife has to do everything she mocks him makes fun of him the kids bring their friends over and they mock their own dad in front of their friends he's an idiot that's not manhood that's not fatherhood that's not what it means to be a husband he's the one who sacrifices he, he, he he's the one who gives everything that's why another title of saint joseph is guardian of the virgin and terror of demons terror of demons See, that's why we need renewed paintings and sculptures of St. Joseph that show him as such. Because as I said at the beginning of this talk, when I became Catholic, most of the images that I saw of St. Joseph were he was like 90 years old or, even worse, effeminate. He looked like a girl. Mm. We got enough confusion today with gender ideology and all the craziness going on in culture. We need him to be presented as a man. 
It didn't have to be Conan, all right, or Rambo, but a man. Because a lot of people, when they've seen him and they see that lily, they think, oh, he's so soft and dainty, right? Might as well be a parasol. No. <laughs> what is that lily? It depicts his purity. His purity. That is so important today because when you're not pure, you have no power. You are spiritually impotent when you fall into impurity. And the devil ain't worried about you. But when you are pure and chaste of heart, you have power. And you too can become a terror to demons. Those titles are for St. Joseph, but they're also for us to imitate like father, like son. Now, ladies, I could give a whole other talk on the feminine dimension of how much you need St. Joseph, but that's another talk for another conference. For my brothers here, you need to be like your spiritual father, St. Joseph. You need to be a terror of demons. You need to stop clicking that mouse and falling into these particular sins. I know it can be hard. It can be a habit. You can overcome this. Do you know the amount of stories that I've heard this year of men who have done this consecration program and their, 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 their number one fault was lust, especially acting out porno through pornography? Decades of bondage to this. After doing the program, sweet freedom. Why? Because one of the, 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 the privileges of devotion to St. Joseph as given to us by Venerable Mary of Agreda, this mystic from Spain in the 16th century, the number one privilege is purity. Purity. This is why, part of why, God has given to us in our time a renewed understanding, appreciation, a refresher on St. Joseph. Because we need him right now more than any previous era needed him before. Because we, we, we're in such messed up times. Now, continuing through the 20th century, more incredible saints are talking about St. Joseph, and then we get a new feast to St. Joseph. May 1st, St. Joseph the Worker in 1950. What, how did that come about? Well, in the mid-20th century, if you were around then, I was only born in 72, but communism was a serious threat. Right? Everybody was worried about the Reds, right? Even shows, oh boy, nobody could watch Archie Bunker today. They, that would think would be so canceled, right? I thought it was hilarious, you know? You commies, you know? So everybody was worried about this, even the popes. And communists wanted to literally take over a secular holiday, a workers' day, and turn it into communist workers' day. They wanted to take away the, the, the dignity of work and the correct understanding of workers' rights and all of those things. And you just belong to the state. So the Pope stepped in, and Pius XII in particular, he said, we now turn May 1st into St. Joseph the Worker Day. And it was amazing what began to happen. You know, and, and we saw what happened, the fruits of it especially during the, the pontificate of John Paul II and the presidency of Ronald Reagan, the communism, you know, many places began crumbling all over the place. Sadly, today, it's rearing its ugly head again under different names, right? The, the Hydra has many heads. Socialism, Marxism. How many young people I see today wearing you know, shirts of Che Guevara? And they think, oh, he's a champion of... Are you... What books are you reading? Do you have any idea what this dude did? And the people he had massacred and murdered? A champion of human rights. You're clueless. Take a trip down to Venezuela or go to Cuba. See how that worked out, right? You keep that nonsense up, you're going to be in a breadline in a couple years. But this is the modern education system, my friends. This is what is being told and indoctrinated into your children. See, everybody today is defund this, defund that. If there's anything that be, needs to be defunded, it's basically the modern secular education system. It's poison to souls. They rewrite history. See, you're in Texas. You understand that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're so messed up that we, we've, we've got to bring this, the reality of these truths, as hard as they are, right? You've got to apply the medicine to the wound, and it's going to sting. That's normal. Because if you don't, you're, it's, it's just going to get worse. It's going to become infected. You're going to have to cut the thing off. We're kind of at the point right now where we do probably have to do some serious severing of, of certain limbs. And nobody wants to be the guy to do that. I, 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 don't, I don't not throw it about the idea, but I, for one, am certainly not afraid to say, you, sir, should not be receiving Holy Communion, right? And 
it's not because I'm mean and nasty and don't love you. It's because I do love you. That's what a real father does. You need a spanking every now and then. You know what I'm saying? So, all right, I'm, I'm really going off up here, right? <laughs> what are we talking about? St. Joseph. Okay. So, so we continue through the century, and then check this out. We should be so honored and privileged to, to realize. Do you know that we did not have St. Joseph's name in the greatest of all prayers, which is the holy sacrifice of the Mass, until 1962? Did you know that? It's amazing. So St. Teresa of Avila in the 16th century, St. Andre Bessette 100 years ago, they didn't hear what you hear today. Every Mass you go to now, after the priest says in the Eucharistic prayer, Our Lady's name, you hear, and her husband, Joseph, in every prayer. Well, how did that come about? Well, I don't have the story, time to give the whole story, but it's an incredible story of a, a, form, a, a bishop in the former Yugoslavia who was in a concentration camp for 10 years. He went to the Second Vatican Council in the first session of it. He championed St. Joseph and said, we need to do this. Sadly, you know what happened? Many of his brother bishops mocked him. They made fun of him for this. Sit down, we've heard enough of your pious speech, they said. How horrible. But the Pope heard it on closed circuit television and he wasn't entertained by it. And he said, I'm gonna do it. One of the first things that happened at the Second Vatican Council in 1962 was the Pope put St. Joseph's name into what's called the Roman Canon. It sounds like fire one, right? It is, really, it's a weapon. So, and now we have his name in all the prayers, all the Eucharistic prayers. No previous generations heard that, but we do today. What a privilege we have. Do you know what St. Teresa of Avila would have done to hear his name in, in, in the Holy Mass? But she didn't live to experience that. We do. Now, how do we get to this, where we're at right now with the year of St. Joseph? As I said, we've never had a year of St. Joseph before. We're probably never, not going to have another one during our lifetime. And you've only got 33 days left. And it's over, right? How do we get to this? How did we crescendo with this? Because we've had Marian years, year of mercy, year of prayer, year of St. Paul, year of this, that, and the other. Great. The fruit of those are amazing. But how did this one come about? All right. So about five years ago, when I felt this total, I mean, I was so convicted that the Holy Spirit wanted me to do something with St. Joseph to, to have one aspect of helping to renew families and all of that. I did the research traveling around the world for three years, right? Pre-COVID, thank God, or I wouldn't have been going anywhere. Translating stuff, having it translated, research in convents and libraries in France and here, there, and everywhere. And it dawned upon me, 2020 is the 150th anniversary of when St. Joseph was declared the patron of the church, 1870, 2020. So that's when I said, I'm gonna have the book come out on January 1st, 2020 in honor of that 150th anniversary. Perfect. Then I also discovered we've never had a year of St. Joseph. And I thought to myself, now's the time. Now is the time, it's perfect for this anniversary when, when we have this crisis in families and marriages and all of that, we need this. But how, how do we do this, right? I don't know the Pope. I don't have his cell number. He don't call me. I don't call him, right? Probably for the best, to be honest with you, right? <laughs> That'd be an interesting discussion. So I'm like, how do we, I don't know him. And I don't even know anybody who knows him, like a, a friend or anything. So I'm like, well, you know what? That dude, that priest 150 years ago, he wrote a letter to the Pope. So I wrote a letter to the Pope. Now, I didn't say I was going to suffer and be willing to die for the cause, right? <laughs> not go extreme now, right? So maybe I should have. I could be possibly a saint by this point, but working on it. So I wrote a letter in English and I said, Dear Holy Father, real simple, a couple paragraphs. I'm, you know, Father Callaway in the United States, and if you would please consider declaring the year of St. Joseph in these times of crisis, attacks on marriage, and all these kind of things. You know, God bless you, Father Callaway. And I thought to myself, okay, cool letter, but it's in English. He doesn't know English. I mean, he can crank out a few words like, it sounds like Klingon when he says it, right? But he don't know English that well. So I'm like, all right, we got to get this thing in Spanish. Now, I do know Spanish pretty well, but I didn't want to write the letter in Spanish because it would have sounded like a third grader wrote it, you know? So I said to a brother, priest in Argentina, my religious community is in Argentina, my friend, Father Dante, I said, hey, can you translate this to me in Spanish and do it up real good, like churchy Spanish, do it up real nice, you know? So he did. And then he said this to me, this is so providential, it, to this day blows my mind. He said, Father, my friend is in Rome right now. He's a bishop, his name is Bishop Hector Zordon. And I was like, okay, and he goes, he's meeting with the Pope tomorrow, <laughs> right? Bishops go to Rome like every five years to check in. Hey, how you doing, how are things going in your diocese, you know? So he's over there, he's meeting with the Pope tomorrow. He says, 
If I text him right now and ask him if we can get this to him electronically today, if he'll hand deliver it to the Pope tomorrow, are you open to that? And I was like, hello, right? <laughs> Beg him. So he did. The bishop said yes. And this is a funny thing about this bishop. Um, his name is Bishop Hector Zordon, but his, the name of his diocese cracks me up. His diocese is Gualiguachu. <laughs> to me, it's like, Gualiguachu, Gualiguachu. Right? It sounds like something you do with a child, you know? So, um, so Bishop Hector Zordon of Gualiguachu, on May 2nd, 2019, hand delivered my letter in English and Spanish to the Pope, and they talked about the letter. We have the pictures from the Servitore Romano, it's a papal photographer's basically. And the, I talked to the bishop afterwards and he told me what they talked about. And so I thought to myself, oh, it's on, baby. It's going down, right? This is going to happen. But if you've ever had any dealings with Rome, you know, molasses, right? It's like so slow. It's like, oh. it takes forever to do anything over there. So I'm like, all right, I'll probably get some letter back from some pious little Italian nun, you know, grazie mille for your letter, you know, and I'm like, Okay, I ain't got time to wait. So what I did, I started to write letters to every bishop in the United States. And I was gonna ask them, please declare a year of St. Joseph in your diocese, because you have the canonical jurisdiction authority to do that in your diocese. Please consider doing it for the good of your people. 11 of them said yes, and were super excited. And the, the things were in motion, and I was so excited. And then all of a sudden, I got a letter from a guy named Cardinal Piacenza in Rome. He's the head of the Apostolic Penitentiary. Now, it's not like the slammer in Rome where bad boys go, right? <laughs> Although they could use a couple of you know, whole show. Life sentences for a few of those characters, right? So, so he sends me a letter and he says this. We will declare a year of St. Joseph for you and for all who do the consecration of St. Joseph program. And he said, and there is something else. But it, it was like cryptic. I'm like, okay, I don't know what exactly that is. What was it? On December 8th, 2020, what happened? The Pope declared a year of St. Joseph for the entire Catholic Church, right? I didn't have to keep writing letters to bishops. He did it in one bang! Yeah. Amazing! So, now, he's never called me yet to say thank you. <laughs> and that's cool, that's cool. Right, I don't need a trophy, I don't care about that titles and whatnot. The point was to make St. Joseph more known and loved, and it's worked. Now everywhere, St. Joseph, St. Joseph, St. Joseph. And when the year of St. Joseph ends on December 8th, next month, things are never gonna be the same. It's not like we're gonna ditch him and put him back in the closet, see you next year at Christmas, you know. Those days are over, my friend. St. Joseph now is a massive part of family lives, of, of devotional lives, of, 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 of parish life, and it's even gonna be more so as we come more out of you know, the, the COVID stuff. Because last year, I really think there was a spiritual battle that was going on. Similar to when the Rosary was founded in the 13th century, a plague hit humanity and wiped out one third of Europe. Seriously, I'm not making this up, the bubonic plague, the Black Death, right? And saints later on said it was the devil's way of trying to get rid of the Rosary when it was given to the world. Well, when this came on January 1st, 2020, what happened like next month? Everything went lockdown. Everything went cray cray, right? So yes, there's human origins for it, Wuhan, right? But there's a spiritual battle going on right now. The devil does not want you to know about the secret weapon of Christianity. A man who, when he goes to Jesus with a petition, it's like a paternal command. When Jesus, to this day in paradise, hears Joseph say something, ask for something, make a request, he's hearing it from his dad. And he loves his dad. Remember Our Lady at Cana? She technically didn't even ask a question. She acknowledged the situation. They have no wine. Boom! You got enough wine for like AA. <laughs> like, holy moly, he made a lot of wine, right? It's like, dang, Lord, right? Tons of vino. Think about St. Joseph. If he asks for something, consider it done. Because Jesus loves his dad, and he's going to do it. It's that paternal authority, that paternal love. And so that's what we need to be doing today. You need to be going to St. Joseph with your family problem, with your, your marriage, whatever issues are going on there, with your delinquent children, with finances, if you're stressed, anxious about your job. I mean, how many people today are losing their jobs? My brother just lost his because he refused to take the jab, so they fired him. 
What insanity is this? He worked from home, the night shift, never even had to go in. This defies reason. It's nuts. I know people that have lost their careers are probably going to lose their pension and all the benefits because of this. This is not right. Who is St. Joseph again? The patron of workers. We've got to beg him to help us, to give us peace and hope in these troubling times. I've met so many people that are so filled with anxiety and fear, especially those in, in the medical profession, those who are teachers. Oh, I got friends out in California. They're about to all lose their jobs. What is wrong with us? I mean, we, we really have messed this thing up and the devil is having a field day. We've got to ask St. Joseph to help us. I'll end with this, because you'll remember this. Remember when you were in Sunday school or your catechism classes when you were a kid, they talked about a Joseph with a whole bunch of brothers whose dad made a coat of many colors, right? Gave it to Joseph, the brothers got jealous and they wanted to kill him, literally. And one brother stepped up, I think it was Benjamin or one of them, and he said, no, no, don't kill him. Throw him in this cistern here and we'll sell him off, get some cash, right? That's my modern interpretation of the <laughs> event, right? So they sell him off and his captors take him to Egypt. This was Joseph, not our Joseph, but Joseph centuries before, right? Take him to Egypt, Pharaoh, he's under Pharaoh, and Pharaoh takes a liking to him because he helps Pharaoh out. Pharaoh puts him in charge of his granaries, bread. At that time, Egypt was the bread basket of the world. Joseph was in charge. A famine happens worldwide. In the known world at that time, a famine. Even Joseph's own brothers come looking for food. He plays with them a little bit. Actually, puts a chalice, very interesting, in their bag, right? If you remember the story. Then they find it. Like, How'd this get there? And then he, you know, they think that it was planted there, which it was. Very important, though, because chalices contain something, right? Especially the chalice that we drink from. So, Pharaoh says to the entire world, when people are coming to Egypt, Ite ad Yosef. Go to Joseph, is what it means. A pagan ruler told everybody, the entire world, go to Joseph to get bread. To get bread. That really happened historically, but it was just a preparation, a prefigurement for a much greater Joseph with a much greater bread. When the true bread came down from heaven, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, which means in Hebrew, house of bread. In Aramaic, it means house of meat or house of flesh. When our true bread came down from heaven, placed in a manger from where we get the word manjare, eat, right? That bread was threatened by a lunatic, a madman, Herod. You could call him Planned Parenthood, whatever, right? <laughs> our Joseph took our bread for safekeeping to Egypt, mm -hmm, right? All this is going to be fulfilled and play out according to providential plan, and kept for safekeeping in Egypt. And then out of Egypt came our Joseph with the bread to feed the nations. My friends, do you realize the connection between the Eucharist and St. Joseph? You wouldn't have a Eucharist today were it not for St. Joseph, who is the Savior of the Savior. I didn't make up that title. The saints did. It's in my book. He's not the Messiah or God. It's a small less for him. But not even Our Lady has that title. St. Joseph saved the Savior. For us, that's what a good father does. He provides food for his children. And in these times today, we have something much, much, much more dangerous than COVID. And I'm not denying that COVID isn't real and people suffer and get sick and die from it. Sure, we need to pray for that to go away. But we have a spiritual poison, lukewarmness and mediocrity today that has affected the church in such a huge way. And people are starving. They're starving for the truth. We're in a spiritual famine right now. And who do we need to go to to open the granaries, the houses that contain the bread? Joseph. Open them for us, Joseph. Open them for us. We are starving here. Our, 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 we're worried. We're anxious. We got marital problems. We got children away from the faith. We got so many situations. Where can we go? You're the man that God entrusted his only son into the care of. You were good enough to raise the Messiah. He wanted to be like you. He wanted to act like you. And today he still calls you dad. Okay, maybe I'll end on one more thing. Listen to this. This isn't in the book because I only found out about it after the book came out. But you can affirm it or deny it, ladies, especially here. When a baby says its first words around the world in any culture, do you know what 99% of the time the baby says? That's correct. Right. Moms are probably like, no, mama, 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 I told you. Right? No. 
It's Dada. Or in the case of Jesus, Abba. Abba. And he would have been looking at Joseph. Abba. Daddy. Right? Our Lady wasn't jealous, of course not. She would have delighted in this. What a joy. In all likelihood, the first words that came out of the mouth of Messiah as a little baby looking at Joseph were Abba. We need to restore the importance of fatherhood, my friends. In your family, don't be afraid, men, to lead. Don't be afraid to do this. I know it can be hard. Trust me, it's not easy. We're, we're proud men, right? It's tough for us to, to pick up a rosary and do it. But the power that you will have in doing this, when, you can, when your little princess, your little daughter sees you doing this, oh, the, the weight of that. When, when your little boy sees you doing that on your knees, treating his mother, your bride, with respect, your words are not harsh and critical and constantly cutting her down, but affirming her beauty, even as the years go by and gravity gets her and pulls it south, <laughs> you must be faithful. Right? How many times does that happen? Runs off with the younger secretary. You shameless man. You made a commitment. You have to be faithful to it in good times and bad, in health and in sickness, when gravity is great and when gravity gets her. Right? You must be faithful. The example of that will be tremendous. I, I met a couple here today. Who is, is it 45 years a couple is celebrating their anniversary today? I, I met somebody here around there. God bless you. What an example. What an example. Now, for those of you who have jacked it up, because <laughs> a lot of you have, don't worry. It's not too late. Many people panic and they say, Father, I messed it up. I was a horrible father. I didn't pray. And now my children don't go to church and this, that, and the other. This is my second marriage and whatever. Okay, okay. Remember, we're all sinners. We're all broken, wounded, and make mistakes. God is a father of mercy. He's a good father. You know that song, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, right? I just, man, I just, my soul just melts in that song. Because it's true. Even if you've messed it up and your example was bad when you were a young father, you've got to carry that cross now, but you can offer that suffering, that sacrifice up for the spiritual birth of your children. As long as you've got a pulse, you've got hope. God has not given up on us. He never will do that. We've just got to trust. We've got to be faithful. Now is the time for conversion. Now is the time for receiving all the graces that he wants to give us. 33 days left. Today, fascinating, is the last day to start. It's a 33-day program. If you start today, and I'm not doing this shamelessly to plug the book, you know, it just happens to be, you, you, you invited me to speak on November 6th, okay? It's your fault. This is the last opportunity to do it. If you start today, it ends on December 8th the grand finale of the year of St. Joseph, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. So do it. If you can't do it today, fine, don't worry, don't panic. As, as I said, we're not getting rid of St. Joseph. He's here now to stay a huge part of our lives. I'm gonna pray for you. I know the times are tough. Who knows what the future holds? Could get tougher, who knows? But we have Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. We know we, know we have not here a lasting kingdom. We were made for paradise. We were made to be in heaven. That's our goal. I pray that some glorious day, we all would be there again with each other, rejoicing to be able to see sweet faces of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. God bless you. Thank you so much.